I think my fondest memory is having a conversation with Bill Paxton. Oh, and, I love and, and, and I said, you're my favorite whiner. <laughs> and and, he, and he, those teeth, he goes, what do you mean? <laughs> well, what do you mean? You, you think you're happy <laughs> being catatonic in the closet? I said, that was one, but the one that really gets me is, uh, game over, man. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to PA HorrorCon. Welcome to the Q&A room. Welcome to the Weird Science reunion. Make some noise because we've got Jill Whitlow and Michael Berryman here, the cast of Weird Science. Ow! Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you for bearing with us in this sub-zero freezing room. Oh my goodness, <laughs> It's right? really cold, yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much. Michael's got the right idea with the jacket. Um, I'm going to, you know, try and do my best uh, Donahue and work the audience and, you know, move around, get everyone who wants to question, you know, their hands on the mic. Uh, but to warm things up, uh, what were your first impressions of the project or your earliest memory of weird science coming into your life? My earliest memory was a phone call from my agent. <laughs> <laughs> and they said that they, uh, you don't have to audition. I go, okay, and I'm going to learn about a guy named John Hughes, and it, it, it was fa he has a fascinating mind. He really understands the, uh, the inner workings of, of youth, and uh, I got to meet Vernon Wells and present company, and we, uh, you know, we get, the, the, the kids need a... Uh, uh, a threat so they can become, you know, rise to an occasion and be heroic, so to speak. And uh, it, it just works so well. I mean, some of the stunts, for instance, were amazing. They actually built a house inside a soundstage, and there was a, a stunt woman when she gets uh, pulled up in, out of the chimney and lands in the pond. She really did fall from the, the scaffolding into the pond. Um, oh, gosh. I think my fondest memory is... Um, having a conversation with Bill Paxton. Oh, and, I love and, and, and I said, you're my favorite whiner. <laughs> and and, he, and he, those teeth, he goes, what do you mean? <laughs> well, what do you mean? You, you think you're happy <laughs> being catatonic in the closet? I said, that was one, but the one that really gets me is, uh, game over, man. <laughs> 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 and I saw him at a couple of shows over the years, and they could always make him laugh. He was, he was so easygoing, oh, yeah. very talented. And we all knew that Robert, of course, was a genius. Crazy, but a genius. <laughs> True. So uh, I, was, I was enthralled, worked a couple of days, and was forever grateful. Because at the end, uh, when we exit with Vernon, I, I'd learned enough about filmmaking to where I was doing a moving shot. While I threw out a line, I said, God bless. And I did that because I grew up, grew up, yeah, right. <laughs> we used to go to Red Skelton's house, and he had a TV show called The Red Skelton Show. Uh -huh. And at the end of the show, he would say, I want to thank our sponsors and our viewing audience. Uh, and good night for now, and God bless. And the studio said, you can't say God bless. He goes, really? What's the name of the show? And I go, oh, never mind. <laughs> but he, he had such a sense of... Uh, childlikeness. I used to, we used to go to the house, and I remember one night, I was sitting on the floor of his son, Richard, his son, he died of leukemia, and they're on the sixth grade. Anyway, so we're reading comic books, and Red comes into the room, and, and he sits on the floor with us, reading the comic book, like a little kid. And I ask him, I go, would you please do Gertrude and Heathcliff, the two seagulls? And he, and he did, and Richard and I were just rolling on the floor laughing. But he had a, he, he had a touch of uh, uh, humanity that is missing a, a lot these days. And we're in a strike, our union and our art, because they want to turn us into a chip, AI. They want to take our images yeah. and run us through a computer and have complete control. And you know what? Homie, don't play that. <laughs> <laughs> you got homie. <laughs> I'm, I'm with homie. I'm voting with homie. Um, so, Jill, your first memories of weird science coming into your life? Uh, my agent as well. No. Um, but, yeah. I, probably nobody really knows this because I don't really put it out there. But so I auditioned and 
I auditioned for Judy Aronson's part, and it was between me and her, but me and John got along so well that he actually kind of, you know, said, well, will you do this part? I was brand new, very green, and wasn't ready for such a big role, um, he said. So anyway, I was just blessed to work with him, you know? So, you know, we all flew out in the beginning um, to Chicago. And John is amazing. I love John Hughes. And we sat in first class, because that was SAG back then. <laughs> and <laughs> um, when there was a first class, actually. Um, and, you know, they give you shrimp cocktails and champagne and all that really good stuff. I yeah. always thought that was just from movies. Like, they, they actually no, used to do that? No, they did that. On my, the plane. Yes, on what? the plane. So my dad was a captain on National Airlines back in the day. And, yes, first class, they've always done the shrimp cocktails, the champagne, the white linen. Yeah, wow. it was really classy. It was really first class. Worth the money. Wow. Um, no, no, not foot massages, <laughs> but... Kind of up um, tax bracket. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, I ate the shrimp cocktail, and um, we got to the hotel. We checked in. John says, let me take everyone out to dinner. So we went out to dinner that night, and, you know, with the cast, and... Um, I spent the night at the restaurant in the bathroom with food poisoning up all night long, food poisoning, called my mom, <laughs> mom, I don't know what to do, I have to be on the set in two hours and I can't stop throwing up, <laughs> you know, so went to the set during my scenes, the mall was closed during the shooting, the, the department store. And so the escalators were not on. The bathroom was on the second floor. Between every single take, I'm running to the bathroom, <laughs> getting sick. And we're done with the filming, and I'm like, thank God. So I go back to my hotel, and all I wanted to do was crawl in my, into my own bed and go to sleep. So I flew home. I didn't tell anyone. And my agent calls me and says, what did you do? <laughs> Thank God the dailies came back good because John was a little upset that you just kind of left. And I said, well, I was really sick. <laughs> and I just wanted to be home. Yeah. So that's my little weird science story. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, so how do you, yeah, blood, sweat, I'm and tears, you. right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, but um, yeah, so I mean, what a great experience to work with a director who really, and I have been so blessed, you know, with my career in that. Um, you know, Fred Decker, John Hughes, Bob Clark. I mean, ah, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. you know, Those are like the greats. they just love the industry and love what they're doing so much that you're just allowed to be you, you know, um, you play the character, but you bring you into it. And it just made it so wonderful and easy um, to work with them. That's, yeah, that's it was amazing. great. So I do want to let the audience know, again, this is your Q&A. You have every opportunity to jump in here and ask questions. I could talk their ears off for the duration of the panel, <laughs> and I'm happy to do so. But I don't want you guys to feel like, you know, this guy's not giving the audience a chance to get in there. So we do have one right here. Excellent. Do we need them? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I just want to know when both of you are going to write biographies about your time 
In Mine's Cal- available right now. It's a memoir. Just go to Amazon and put in It's All Good. It's a memoir. It's not about the whole career. It's, uh, it starts with my father coming back from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He's glowing, and I'm born in 1948 with uh, about a dozen birth defects. I had to have a craniectomy at age four, and it arcs. Uh, over the years and a, a, a lot of interaction with people and situations. And it finishes with my father getting to see me in Cuckoo's Nest mm. a couple months before he passes. Mm. So it's a right of, it's, it's a memoir. It's, it's great. available right now. I it's love hearing that. I mean, Joe, we've been best friends for a million years. Yeah, I know. And you always surprise me with some story once in a you while. You know that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like once in a while you, you come up with some stories. Michael, we had breakfast a couple of years ago together at a, some convention, and you talked about you, were, you lived with, in Bob Dylan's house oh. like as a bodyguard or something <laughs> for, for a while. You had a, a number of stories that were, I thought, so yeah, I'm, full of I'm it. like, all this, I'm, needs, I'm, all this well, needs actually, to be in a book. Uh, um, <laughs> When I was trying to get my career going, and, and you want to have some credits to where you can get to the point where they just offer you a part, it, eventually that happens. Mm. So what that means is if the phone rings, they go, your agent will go, okay, I got an interview for you, uh, go to Melrose. It's L.A. traffic, and you maybe get an hour or <laughs> maybe, maybe, if you're lucky, a, a, a day head start. So you have to be in close proximity. So during that period, I actually would slept on a lot of friends' couches, and uh, I finally took my, uh, uh, I had a tr- uh, truck with a camper and my German Shepherd, and yes, for uh, two years, I worked at Bob Dylan's home. Uh, I didn't live in the house, but I was, he has 24-hour guard service. So I went to LAPD, got my weapons permit, and I knew enough uh, about the powers of arrest and how to do it right, not get Bob sued if there was a situation. And so, yes, uh, uh, for two years I worked for Bobby Dillon at his house, and um, I got paid 10 bucks an hour, no overtime, no health insurance, and it was rough to make a living because if I had an audition, I had to, I got to go to the audition. Well, uh, one night I had a, uh, we had an intruder. He was way back in the property, and there's other families living on the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 And my dog alerted me to uh, someone breaking into property. Well, he was a big guy, and along his sidekick was a young, uh, a young lady who was a repeat offender. She used to try to break into the house a couple times a year. She would go to the doing room and, and, and I'd point to him to, to the bar there, and uh, she would try to find a, a large fellow, and she would say, I'm his ex-wife, and there's some guitars in the band room that are my property, so help me break into the house and, and take my property. She'd been arrested many times. So like sure enough, it's her, and there she is. Uh, I see her first, so I grab her, and I go, God, you, you got to go to jail tonight. It's a stupid move. And then I hear footsteps, and my dog alerts me to someone behind me. So I go, oh, man. Oh, great. He, he's got a knife. This is wonderful. Uh-huh. So I used her for a human shield, pushed her into him, <laughs> kicked him in a few tender spots. He dropped the knife, and I just said, you got two choices. Oh, and by the way, my dog is biting him uh, at the time, and I go, Nishka, stop biting the gentleman. Whatever he was on, he sobered up. Anyway, they went to jail, and a lot of blah, 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 we'll come back and get you. That was interesting. Things are kind of normal. And then uh, when I first met Bob Dylan, he had been on tour, and so we got to know the ins and outs of the neighborhood, and uh, in the morning... He comes in late at night, and in the morning, he's coming out. I'm working graveyard, and here comes Bob Dylan walking up to this little shack. It's nothing fancy, and I have the radio on, and it's Bob Dylan. And I go, okay, here's my boss. And I go, Nishka, my dog, don't bark. That's the boss. Oh, okay, friend. He goes, oh, he didn't have dogs. Later on, he had one of her pups. So... He's asking me about some noises he heard that night, and I said, well, there was a coyote trying to get into the chicken coop, and Nishka chased it off. He goes, oh, good doggy. Well, 
the radio is playing a Bob Dylan song, My Back Pages. So I'm going, you know, I've been working for this guy for six months. I'm not, no insurance, no health insurance, 10 bucks an hour, working graveyard, blah, 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 but it's a job. So I go, he's no different than anybody else, really. And I go, hey, Bobby, I was at Santa Monica Civic with my, uh, my sister's husband, an ex-Marine, he said, we have to wear a tie. We're going to go to the Civic to see Bob Dylan. And then when we got okay. there, we go, really, George? So we lose the tie. We're trying to be cool, right? And he comes out, and he does all his acoustic stuff. Then he takes a break, and he comes back out with Clyde e. King, some gospel singers, and an electric guitar. The first time in history he played the electric guitar. Wow. So we're folkies. So we boo him. The first two songs, we're not too happy about him playing, going electric. <laughs> and, and I see the look in his eyes going, oh, I remember. And then I said, I, I said, Bob, and then you played the third song. And you remember what happens then? He goes, yes. What happened was he played all along the watchtower, mm -hmm. electric. He, was, he blew the roof off of the place. And I go, uh, thank you. It was wonderful. And it's, you're, you're, you're a poet, and you rhyme a lot, but... Uh, thank you for what you've written, because he's written some, obviously, mm -hmm. Masters of War, et cetera, et cetera. So that was pretty cool and groovy. And then I go, oh, by the way, this kid on the radio, it's him. Again, he's a good writer like you, but do you think he can have a career with a voice like that? <laughs> and, and I go, I'm either fired or this guy's cool. And he just starts walking away up to the house and laughing, and he looks around and he goes, Maybe. And then the other quick little, then I'll jump forward in time to one night, he calls me up and he goes, uh, George is coming over to jam tonight, so bring him all the way up to the band room when he shows up, George Harrison. And I go, <laughs> got it. So here comes, well, first of all, the, the limousine pulls in and Bobby hadn't called me yet. And we're cautious because there's people who didn't like him. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching the windows, checking it out. The, Window goes down and the driver goes, I have Bob Dylan, I, I have George Harrison here to see Bob Dylan. And we never give information when you're doing security. I go, Oh, that's interesting. Could I see your version of a George Harrison, please? It rolls the window down. It's George Harrison. And I give him a wink and I go, Great. Uh, please turn around and leave. And I hear George go, Oh, yeah, I forgot to call him, let him know he had a phone in the car before, so forth. And, and I go, if you come back and my phone rings, we could have, continue our conversation. Mm. So Bobby calls me, and then he says what I said earlier. So I take him up to the band room, we high five and hug each other, and uh, I'm doing rounds, just, just checking everything out. I took a little Sony tape recorder, and I put it in the windowsill of the band ah. room at about one in the morning. Ah. And it, it, the tape will go for two hours. I got two hours of George and Bob wow. Dylan on cassette, and no, it's not for sale, and I will never post it. It's <laughs> private stash, man. And so here I am sitting, at, and I give full reign to my dog to go anywhere in the property. So I'm sitting, having, looking out at the ocean with a full moon, hear the ocean breaking, and Bob and George are, are jamming. By. So you know what? I never bitched or complained about making 10 bucks an hour after that. That's right. Uh, or insurance. It was cool. <laughs> What a great story. Yeah. Bad so I do want to, again, let the audience jump back in if we have more questions. If not, I could definitely go. We'll ask you questions. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. exactly, right? <laughs> um, so I was born in a town that you've both heard of, of course, uh, called Northbrook, Illinois, where mm -hmm. the majority of John's films were shot, uh, including Weird Science, even the Northbrook Court Mall. That was my yeah. mall when I was a little kid. Oh. That was my 80s mall. It was my introduction to what a mall was. Yeah. Um, so I just have to ask if there's anything that you remember about being in Northbrook or shooting in Northbrook or John's love of the Midwest, mm. um, any, any of those? Just running up and down the escalator at the North Fork Mall. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I filmed at the studio in L.A. Oh, okay, right, yeah, that. The house yeah, and I there. remember a lot of gold. Like, it was a really pretty mall. I could see that, You yeah. know, I, yeah. I remember walking, I'm a mall girl. Okay. I, Bobby knows. <laughs> Every city I go to, can we go to the mall? Um, but you got to hurry because it's going to close soon. Um, <laughs> but I remember it being very large and just really, really pretty and thinking, I wish I had one of these. And But, you know, you know totally they soon all started to look like that. 
It's a shame because that mall didn't stay that way for very long. By the really? mid by the mid nineties, it was like we're like an adult mall now. Like we don't want kids and riffraff and teenagers. And I'm like, that's oh, why I love this shame place. Shame on them. Yeah, I know. It's because you guys are the ones with all the money. Well, well it's the <laughs> ones who spend it all. Is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying we earned it or anything back in those days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Daddy's credit card. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in the day, maybe. <laughs> Um, so another thing I've always loved about Weird Science is to me it's one of the most perfect soundtrack albums ever. Mm. So I've always wondered, you know, do you guys have a favorite song in the soundtrack? Is it the obvious Oingo Boingo title track? Or is there a deep cut like uh, The Circle by Max Carl that uh, especially speaks to you off the soundtrack? Oh, I just like the title version. Yeah, just me got, too. It, 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 it's got a hook immediately. Huh. It's got to be. You know it's Weird Science. Well, that and it's like. Science. Right? It's yeah. got to be the greatest theme song. I mean, if not the greatest theme song ever, definitely the greatest theme song that has the title of the movie in the chorus. In the because chorus. Because that's really hard to do. True. Yeah. And, like, only Danny Elfman could have pulled that off. I and think. I didn't mean because it said weird science in it, but it you just know because of the beat. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It's you weird science. It. As soon as you hear. Yep. Dun, dun, dun. It's Yeah. Yeah. I love Oingo yeah. Boingo. And were you guys surprised yeah. that, you know, Danny went on to have such an epic film scoring career? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talent preempts your fame. Yeah. True. Exactly. Very true. Oh, we got a question right here. Excellent. I'll bring the mic to you. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, he was teasing me when you said you're a mall girl because that's me too. When oh, I go really? places, it's like he's he's like, I'm like, let's go to the mall. Oh, okay, you know. <laughs> but um, out of all the places you've worked, what what was like your favorite mall? My favorite mall? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um. Mm. Well. Uh, that is so hard. hard, hard. <gasps> okay, I, okay, I'll ask you an easier. In Detroit. In Detroit. Yes. I don't know the name of it, but oh my gosh, it is so cool. And it's S got. Somerset? In Detroit. Was it Somerset Mall? I, I think it was. High is end. it really, really big? High end. Yeah. Yeah, Somerset. Very high end. Yeah. And you can take the escalator, the walking escalator. Yeah, I lived in Michigan for the two years. I know thing? exactly what mall you're talking about. Okay, yeah. to the even higher end side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I loved that mall. How about... And you know what? Did you ever do Horton Plaza in San Diego? That's no. a really cool one. It's an outdoor mall. And really? it's got several levels. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to check that one out. Well, there's the Mall of the Americas. I think that's in uh, Yes. Uh, well, Minnesota. then there's, a, there's yeah. also, there's also yep. a big, huge mall in, in Jersey called the American <laughs> Dream Mall. I want to go there. Okay, and then another one of my all-time favorites will always be because it close to my heart because it's where my mom took me to get my prom dresses every year was Bell Harbor uh, in Miami. So, North Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So. I have another question, not weird science related. What was it like working for Bob Clark and Porky's? Oh my God. I loved, oh. I loved Bob Clark. Oh, I miss him so much. He was the reason why I ended up in film. Because I was only 16 when I did that movie, when I was in Porky's. And um, he sent me to New York um, to meet an agent and also Eileen Ford. And um, they wanted me to move to New York. And my mom said, no way. My little girl is not going to move to New York. She is going to graduate high school. <laughs> and Bob's like... But she will be taking care of... Nope. No. And I'm like, wow. Mom! <laughs> really? <Wow. laughs> so, at any rate, he said, when you're ready, come to L.A. and I'll take care of you. That's cool. And he nice. did. Yeah. He was like a father. He was amazing. Yeah. Amazing human being. It's, it's like, so weird to think that he did Porky's and then, you know, he did Black Christmas. You know, I know, right? Christmas. It's like... Christmas story. They're all yes. like 
right. I like, know. Way diff- all very different films. Yeah, yeah, but he was so creative, you know? Yeah. Those of you that don't know, there is a Christmas story sequel from like 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, supposed to be the next summer. Was, you know, oh, really? I didn't yeah. know about that. It's pretty good. It is actually a really decent movie. It's got Charles Grodin taking over the role of the dad. They still live next door to the Mumbuses. Huh? You know, it's, it's just six months later, it's about fishing instead of well, Christmas. Not to not to promote another con, but you know, Chiller has a Christmas story reunion. Oh, oh wow! This October. Oh. We had Zach a couple couple shows ago at the Jersey. Well, they've got Peter, Peter, Peter That's pretty amazing. Hmm. Um, so, getting a little bit back towards weird science, if we yeah. can, um, you know, it's one of my favorite eras of film, in the in the sense that like every movie that made a cent of profit in the 80s. Someone was like, at a TV network, was like, maybe we can do this here. <laughs> yeah. But Weird Science, the show, didn't happen until like many years later. And it actually had a much longer run than any of these like Fast Times, the the show didn't, yeah, I think Fast it was like Time one season. One. Ferris Bueller, the show, was like one season. Yeah. But Weird Science actually ran for like good, you know, I think six seasons on, wow. you know, it was on cable. But um, USA. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was curious, did you guys ever watch the TV series? No. Never? <laughs> I didn't even know there was one. You didn't know there was one? <laughs> this is the wood. We gave the world Vanessa Angel. I mean, she's, she's no Kelly LeBrock, but, you know, we love yeah. Vanessa Angel, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, huh. It's actually a pretty, pretty decent... Fun. Yeah, it's really not a bad show. But you know? it probably lasted so long because it's such a... Um, it's such... Um, you can do so much with that kind of concept, yeah, you know, with that um, subject. I yeah. mean, you really can. It can go so many different ways, and it was way ahead of its time as well. So, you know. Well, I think, uh, I think what is, is, is true is that uh, people started writing scripts from the perspective of the sensibilities of youth, Instead of adults saying, here's how youth should be, could be, or are, through their interpretation, through the eyes of the child. Because uh, I, I, that's one of the things I noticed about John when we had a few conversations, and I said, your, your choices of how the characters are in situations and the way they respond to s- situations is, is how they would react as opposed to an interpretation from someone who's not a child, so to mm. speak. So uh, he, he, he shared with me something that, like, in my memo, I talk about my, my, my grandmother, Sophie, and she always said, be childlike, not mm-hmm. childish. And, and John had that same sensibility because mm. he was very honest about how kids would behave. Like when, when um, the boys in the film, when they go out to the nightclub, and, and the, 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 the black gentlemen are, you know, and they get drunk and they get silly and they start treating them just like an adult. And yet with their silly uh, innocence, uh-huh. it's, it's just it's, it's very, very cute. And then, of course, they talk about escapades they haven't even had yet. And then, of course, they throw up. <laughs> 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 but uh, it, it's nice to have that reveal yeah. because I think it, 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 it shows appreciation of what, what the short period of youth is and how innocent and how uh, honest they are. You ask a kid, they'll say mm-hmm. the darndest thing, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, Out of uh, the mouths of babes. I think that's a great, uh, a great approach to uh, uh, writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you want to give the audience another chance to jump in if we have audience questions? Oh, we got one here? Great. <laughs> I just don't want to hog the mic. You know, oh, Bobby. I want to ask. Uh, do you remember any kind of weird science premiere screening that you attended? Or no, when, how, what would, how did you feel about the finished product when you first saw it? Or where were you? Or Was there a premiere that you went to? Uh, I, I never saw it in a theater. I, uh, when I got it on VH, uh, I don't know if it was on VHS. VHS. VHS mm. you know, yeah. uh, I just had fond memories. Uh, I never saw it in a theater. I didn't go to the screening. Okay. I, I didn't either. Gosh. You might have been on so to other projects, ago, too. 
We were in another zip code. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I just remember, um, you know, just I'm hoping to God that this really starts my career off, mm. <laughs> you know? And, well, the first time I got a residual okay. check and it said weird science, uh, I go, cool. <laughs> I know. It's I know. so nice. I still get them. I do too. Yeah, they're like 10 cents. Oh. <laughs> I got every, so we, when we sign our contracts with, with SAG, there's a, a line where you can say, any residual that is a dollar or less, don't send it to me. Put it to the old actors fund. Oh. And, and some of those productions uh, I didn't get that were memo. shelled. But they've been out for a long time before that was an option, you see. So contractually, they have to send you a check. Yes. And there's a place in, 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 in uh, uh, Burbank, and it's called Residuals. It's a bar. Huh. And a lot of people in the industry go there. Put and on the, and on the wall on are the checks wall. For, one, for one penny. And, and then you autograph, and they put it on the wall, you get a free drink. Oh, how so funny. So the gross amount is two cents, and the government <laughs> takes 50%. Yes, exactly. So you end up with one. Yeah. Yeah. It's hysterical. It costs, my wife always laughs. She goes, it costs more money to cut the check and mail it to you than the, the yeah, I know. But so, some, of the, some of them have more numbers to the left at a decimal point, yeah. which I really appreciate. And some are like grouped together, like Weird Science, Streets of Fire, Nine of the Creeps. Right. And I, I, I open up, you know, every time I get it, because it's quarterly. Yeah. So once that time comes, I know I'm going to get another one tomorrow. Um, and I'm always so excited, like, is this a big one? Is this going to be the big one? And I open <laughs> it up, and I'm, I see, like, ten movies, and I'm like, oh, yes! And it's like $1.89. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I got some uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I'm at, getting old. At, at a stack of, like, six, uh, six or eight. Oh, I, I and wait. And get caught up. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, pennies, pennies, dollars, dollars. Yeah. Oh, that'll help. <laughs> I got ten dollars now, <laughs> but ten checks. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's a lot more. Yeah, but, uh, sometimes it is. But a good God talk. bless you. I'm a, I'm a union guy from way back when. Uh, we we live in Michigan now. Uh, you know, uh, people need to understand that uh, about five percent of the members of SAG mm. are, are the millionaires and billionaires, and the rest of us, like fifty to sixty percent, make less than a thousand dollars a year. So I've met people who go, I can't wait to be in the show. I, I came out of an interview for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Well, they were going to hire me because I had skull surgery and I could be a lobotomy patient. And it would be real easy because I don't have any dialogue. And the casting director uh, said, you're the guy. <laughs> well, getting ready to go for this interview, and they, oh, they, they said, get an agent. Right, OK, fine. So I, Getting an agent that's licensed and franchised is one thing, but they're not all winners. <laughs> so I go up and I meet this guy, a typical, uh, no, no reference to you, Hawaiian shirt, <laughs> Hawaiian shirt, gold chain with a gold little cocaine spoon. Yeah, he goes to Hefner's. You have a spoon? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, been there, done that, grow up, move on. <laughs> and, and he was a real creepy guy. And there was all these gals, oh, I, I can say gal, um, in the waiting room waiting to be represented by this guy. And he had the Epstein stench. Uh, I'll, I'll just be blunt. I'm a pretty straight talking uh, guy. And I go, wow, predator. Oh. So before I left, well, I, here's what he says. So, one flew over to Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. Uh huh. You, and uh, what makes him think you're an actor? I was not happy with that question. I, I said, I've worked one day for uh, Taft Hartley for George Powell and his casting director found a picture. So now I'm here talking to you because I need an agent. You're going to get 10% for doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I said, here's what I think of you. I won't say, what, but you can just imagine. Uh, and since then, I've worked with retired law enforcement and invisible people and help mothers and children not be dead, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, Amazing. Like keep the bad guy away from them. Yeah. So that's one of my hobbies for decades. Well, I told this guy what I thought of him. 
And I go, Michael, you need to control yourself. Before I met my wife, she's calmed me down a lot. I used to have uh, a short temper. <laughs> so I go to leave, and um, I go, well, uh, next interview must be better. Anyway, I, I called a friend later, and I got a good agent. When I get down to uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard, it's traffic, L.A., smoggy, noisy, and I see a white Chevy Nova, about 1967, with Kansas plates. And, and uh, the, the, the man and the woman are, are uh, maybe their grandparents, okay? And there's this cute little blonde uh, gal sitting in the back. And I go, you can't park here. You need to go around the corner, and there's a safe place to park. You'll get a ticket. So they park, and I go, so what are you all up to, on vacation? No. Our, nie our daughter won a beauty contest and a talent contest, and they, they are going to sign her up with a very powerful talent agent. Oh, no. We're going to get her an apartment, <laughs> and she's going to be a movie star. And I go, who might the agent be? Same guy. <laughs> oh. And I said, uh, we need to talk. Uh. So I brought him up to speed, and I said, so you're going to stay with her as chaperone, right? Oh, no, she'll be just fine. And then when she comes back out, uh, well, before she left, I, I said, look, straight up, uh, you need a chaperone, number one. Number two, you might want to b get a uh, reputation in your local theater and learn your craft before you try it on your own. I said, this, this town will chew you up and you use you it. Out. And I remember watching them drive off into the smog, and I'm going, I, just... I hope it's a good story, because it can be brutal. I mean, yeah. it's not just our industry. It's anywhere and everywhere. So um, I always wonder what became of her. Yeah. yeah. But it was terrifying, because, oh, he's going to go see what's this. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Well, I hate to end on a dark note, but we uh, are just about out of time. Oh, we can go much darker. <laughs> well, I, on the other hand, just to leave on a good note. Yes, please. I moved out to L.A. when I was 19, alone, and I had a great experience. I really did. Everything was just easy and, and good. I had Bob Clark behind me though. There you go. And he got me to the right people and agency and manager. But, you know. You danced with Prince. Well, I did. <laughs> you danced with Prince. I did. Oh, yeah, that's what wow. At Voila. Do you remember Voila? The nightclub on the bottom oh my God. in the parking lot of oh the Beverly Center right next to the Hard Rock. Uh, I got this in Vancouver, but I, I do love the hard rock. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. Story from hard rock. Voila. Pardon me? What about the Bruce Willis story? Oh, the from hard rock. Bruce Willis story. <laughs> oh, God. What's that not our Bruce Willis. Well, uh, all right, that one's at the table only, folks. You guys yeah. got to pay for that one. <laughs> So, yes, unfortunately, we oh, yeah. are about out of time, but be sure to stop by Michael and Jill's table. Get some pictures, get some autographs. I know they have a lot more stories to tell you and put your hands together. Make some noise for the cast of Weird Science. Thanks, guys. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here today. Amen. So That's thank you. True. This is Ross Marquand, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight, which is awesome. So like, share, and subscribe. Oh, and have fun, and follow your fandom. <laughs>